Luke, welcome What's to the up, podcast. Wes? Thanks How's for it dropping. Going? Good man. Thanks for dropping in with me. No problem, man. Love how to be here. How are you doing today? You know, no real complaints. All good. Things are good. Things, despite the current situation in the world. Hey, I'm just doing my thing. That's right, man. That's all we can do is put our heads yeah. down and focus on what we can control, and uh, everything else will happen the way it happens. So, um, no, I'm excited to have you on. And we were just kind of chatting before we started recording. Uh, I mean, obviously, you and I know each other very well, but I'm excited for the audience to get to know you a little bit and hear your story because, I mean, you've got a great story. I'm, I mean, just a, you know, great entrepreneurial story and what you've accomplished. But, you know, it's also one of those stories where you had a lot of success. You kind of had to start back over almost from scratch. And then, you know, you were able to build it up again, but in an entirely different way than you initially had success in your career. So, you know, maybe start off just, just by sharing a little bit of your, your story with the audience. And uh, well, I, maybe- I think it's probably more appropriate to start further back than kind of what you're, uh, you know, you, you sent me earlier kind of the layout or uh, the questions relative to you know, this podcast. And <clears throat> I think and, and to provide context and also to provide hope for people <laughs> who are out there, that may not think they have it or what it takes to be a business owner is that um, I, 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 I started with no intention of uh, being a business owner, no intention of being necessarily successful, etc. cetera, I had no idea. I was a horrible student in high school. Um, my parents, in fact, shipped me off to Fort Kenyon Military Academy as a 19-year-old postgraduate because I just barely got through through high school and they were concerned about me. Um, and so I went to Fort Kenyon. It provided structure. I played basketball, which allowed, you know, to some degree to me to, to do better than maybe I should have. Got me into college. Uh, I went through college as a you know a decent basketball player, had a really good mentor, which we'll talk about later, uh, in my basketball coach there, Bob Johnson. Um, uh, got through college uh, barely. Um, and after college, moved into my parents' basement, which is really cool. <laughs> Being 23 or 24 years old, living in your, in your parents' basement. Yeah. Um, I weaved hammocks, had no direction, didn't know what I was going to do. You know, when I, when I look back at my father, who was a plastic surgeon here in Wilmington and before that in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, is um, he was a guy that from an early age, even as a teenager, knew that he wanted to be a doctor. Right. So he had a clear path to what he wanted to do. And even though some of that uh, direction um, – was not something he wanted to do like chemistry and biology. He wanted to be a doctor and he knew he had to suffer through some of the things that he was not necessarily interested in, in order to achieve his goal. Yep. Most kids, even some adults don't really know what they want to do and how to do it. And so um, when I graduated from college, I had no clear direction. I had a communications degree and I had an English degree. Um, and my choices were really to go into uh, some type of media uh, reporting. Uh, I did a uh, internship when I was in college with um, a uh, ABC affiliate called WKPT in Kingsport, Tennessee. And I knew after that uh, internship that that was not where I wanted to be. And I could have been a teacher. Um, I knew that at least at that point, when I looked at the income that teachers made, that that was really not where kind of I wanted to be. Yep. So I came home to Wilmington, North Carolina, after playing four years of college basketball at Emory and Henry College in Virginia uh, with no direction. And so my parents fortunately allowed me to live in their basement. Um, I weaved hammocks which was a really, really cool job. <laughs> it, didn't, it, didn't, it didn't provide much income, um, but it gave me beer money and 
gas money, et cetera, but I was still living with my parents in my mid twenties. Yeah. I ended up selling cars. I sold insurance. I delivered pizzas. I waited tables. None of which, not, not any, none of that stuff provided me what I would consider like this kind of life satisfaction. Sure. I just, I never, I never felt comfortable in any of those roles. And in fact, you could say I was not very good at any of them. And at best I was okay, but miserable. Right. Um, and by my late twenties, still kind of in that position, um, I started to become scared. Yeah. And I was scared because I didn't know what skill sets that I had. Um, and that, you know, getting started in anything, um, you, you know, you, you, you kind of either know where you are and know where you're not. I, I, had, I was at a, a complete state of confusion. Yeah. And fortunately for me is it was something amazing happened really in my late twenties. My sister who worked at uh, Belks um, and she was selling cosmetics met a friend of hers who was in the mortgage business and um, she uh, was able to uh, get a job there and it took you know four or five months for her to understand the industry and she started to do quite well and I actually thought that look my sister's smart and she's cool and all that and she's a great person I'm way smarter than she is <laughs> and she's yeah. doing better than I'm doing right and so I was like I need I need to figure if if that's uh, an opportunity for me. Sure. And so um, I went and interviewed and the guy actually told me, I can remember he's the manager. His name was uh, Hugh uh, said, Hey, look, you've bounced around a lot in your twenties for the last four or five years. Um, but based on your sister's performance, I'm willing to give you the opportunity. Mm. And you know what happened is it was, it was a job that I loved. I could not wait to get up in the morning to go to work. I love the people. I love the company. I love the work that was involved in actually doing that business. And so the reason I even say all of that is to give context to what Steve Jobs said. And I'm going to kind of preempt you on one of your questions that was in there is that what's the best advice you've ever been given? And the best advice I was ever given was not relative to a person actually physically talk like my dad or my previous boss. No, it was, it was a quote that I read mm -hmm. and it was by Steve jobs and Steve jobs said, and I'll paraphrase here. It won't be perfect, but he said that work involves so much of our life that in order to have life satisfaction, that you got to do great work. And in order to do great work, you got to love what you do. Mm -hmm. And if you don't love what you do, keep looking. Because ultimately, forget income, forget money, that will come. It comes with great work. Great work comes with doing what you love. So there's this, it's almost like this discovery, especially with young people, or, and it could be adults that have jobs for years and years and years, that they get up and they do a good job. And, you know, but, but ultimately, they're not satisfied in what they're doing. And the reason they're not satisfied is because they don't love it. Yep. Right. And so money is, is, is actually secondary, but, but our goal, and when we think about life satisfaction, what is it? It's, it's, it's doing the things that you love to do. And when you love to do them, you'll be good at it. If not great at it. And the money is secondary. So no, for um, sure. Anyway, and, and I, I look, I appreciate you providing that context. Cause it's, you know, I think a very common thing, right? I mean, coming out of college or even going into college or, or people later in life, they, they put all this pressure on themselves because they feel like they have to know exactly what they want to do. And I was just on someone else's podcast. Uh, we recorded it a couple of days ago and, and we were talking about the same subject. And I was commenting on how fortunate I feel that, you know, I got introduced to franchising and just kind of this more entrepreneurial way of thinking at a younger point in my life because it kind of did the same for me that the mortgage industry did for you. It gave me something that I got excited about and exactly. you know, was really enjoying doing, but, but I fell backwards into it, right? It's not like I kind of 
was like so wise and, and sat back and was like, hmm, what's going to give me that satisfaction? So I think you've got to give yourself some leeway. You know, if you don't have that kind of sense of purpose from a young age, like, like your father did, you got to give yourself some leeway to try different things and, and, and figure out what it is that you can really get excited about. And then everything you said, I, I totally agree with the, the income, all of that will come. And, you know, I think a lot of people stay in jobs that they're miserable in because they make pretty good money and, and you're not going to yeah. be satisfied with your life if, if that's the, the route that you go. So I, I, I love that you told that part of the story um, cause it'll frame up the rest of your story. Well, but I, I think you're right. It will actually give some hope to so many other people out there that are going through or have been through the, the exact same scenario. Yeah. I just, I, I guess for me is I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, you know, when I think about, um, what I went through is, is that there are two, two elements here, which is one is, is don't type cast your children. Mm-hmm relative to their past and don't typecast yourself yeah relative to your own past right it's this constant search in helping not only your kids but yourself find the business the opportunity the things you want to work on that you love and so it doesn't mean quit your job it doesn't mean you know neglect your family it means that you are constantly in search of, you know, finding this space where when you're operating in it, you feel good about it. Yeah. Right. And if you feel good about it, usually it means that you found this kind of satisfaction in the work that you do. And in that work, money will come. Income will come because you'll be great at it. And so that, that, that's, you know, kind of that's my feeling about what I've lived through which is could I do other jobs and be six, be okay at it and make a living and provide for my family? Yeah, of course I could. If I had to do it, I could do it. Yep. Would I wake up every day excited about going to work? No, I wake up every day. Can't wait to, you know, work in the businesses that I'm in. And yeah. so, and that, that wasn't an overnight thing. It didn't happen at 20. It was an evolution. Yeah. And so that evolution should be embraced. And well, so, I think it's a continuous evolution. And, and to your point, you know, don't necessarily typecast yourself, you know, based on what you've done before. Because, you know, as you kind of get into the rest of your story, you know, you got into the mortgage industry, loved it, did very, very well yep. in that industry. But then, you know, you've gone down a completely different path since then, too, and, and done some awesome things that that you love doing now. Right. So I think you've also got to give yourself that flexibility to understand that what you enjoy doing is very likely to change over the course of your life and, and allow yourself to explore some different uh, avenues and see, you know, what gets you excited. Cause what gets you no excited question. today may not have gotten you excited 10 years ago or what excited you 10 <laughs> years ago may not excite you today. Absolutely true. Yeah. Absolutely so, true. So you get into the mortgage industry and, and tell us a little bit more about your experience there. So I got into the mortgage industry. There was a, uh, a local company that my sister went, went to work for, that I went to work for, enjoyed it very much, um, actually did quite well. Um, if, if you want to look at it as, or, or, you know, the title, I was an I was a entry level mortgage originator, had no clue what I was doing, um, <clears throat> but did okay. And also, I, you know, I think the, the people that owned the business felt that I had a pretty good personality that I was a good relationship developer, et cetera. They opened a wholesale department. I went into their wholesale world. I was about to have a child. Um, and so uh, even though I enjoyed it, I felt additional pressure to work, you know, a little bit harder maybe than I would have otherwise to support my family. Mm -hmm. um, and then this opportunity came up shortly thereafter. It was a publicly traded mortgage company called Novastar. And I interviewed with a guy named Dave Pazgan to be a local rep in southeastern North Carolina um, as a wholesale mortgage rep. And I can explain what that means if people care about it. But there are mortgage brokers, mortgage bankers, et cetera. Most of those people don't have the money. They're looking for outside companies to provide the product and the money. And they provide the customers and we provide the guidelines that actually they fit into and they may send the loan to us for underwriting. Right. Et cetera. 
And so um, I I took that job and uh, within a matter of, I don't know, uh, a year or so, I I was the rookie of the year in a, you know, uh, nationally uh, publicly traded company um, in southeastern North Carolina where loan amounts were a lot smaller than North Carolina, New York, Texas, Florida, et cetera. And so it gave me some recognition. The reason I was good at it is because I loved it. I, be, I felt like that I was in the mortgage industry that I was a problem solver, mm-hmm. which is, you know, how does this deal work better? You know, what do we need to take out? What do we need to add, et cetera? And so um, I knew the products, the underwriting guidelines better than most of the underwriters. And the reason I did that is because um, I liked it. Yeah. I liked un- Understanding how the system worked and how it moved and all that. And so I spent a lot of time researching it. I did a lot of calls, et cetera. And so um, that gave me the opportunity to become a regional manager. Uh, I actually stepped backwards in uh, income to take the regional man- manager position. Um, Novastar afforded me the opportunity to uh, take a course in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania called DDI which was a interviewing process based on uh, behavioral interviewing. Um, I learned a great deal. I was very excited about it, Um, uh, that education. And so maybe I took it more seriously than other folks did, but I have continued to use DDI competency-based behavioral interviewing relative to the position um, for for the rest of my career. And so that still lives with me today, which I got in the early 2000s. Um, regional manager is Dave Pazgan was my boss. He had hired a bunch of people in North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia. You know, you guys have done, I think, interviewed Dave on this podcast. Yep. I fired all of his people. Just so <laughs> <you know. laughs> Every one of them. Yeah. Why? I've Why heard that story. They were necessarily... Uh, bad, but they were not the right type of people that fit into the organization that I wanted to develop. Yep. Did I know what I was talking about at the time? Not really, but I had a vision (laughs) of what I wanted to create. Right. And, you know, you call it stroke of genius. You could call it that DDI allowed me to create this uh, um, territory, whatever. It's not Luke so smart. Luke took what the the uh, science says and put it in play versus me hoping people would work out or me liking people or wanting them to do well and I, I removed that from the equation and so uh, I was able to take a territory that was doing five million um, a month in loan production and create it to about 70 to 80 million a month in a matter of less than 12 months. Wow. And so they had to change my comp plan. Just saying. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, this guy's making more than the CEO of the much. company. <laughs> yeah, and so it's like, it's, it's, uh, it was a validation for me that the system worked. And if it worked then, it'll always work. Yeah, right. because it is. It's science-based, right? It's, sci- it's science-based. Um, I think where people you know, when they talk about behavioral interviewing, you have to have the competencies right relative to the position. Mm -hmm. And if you get the competencies right relative to the position, then the behavioral part becomes easy, right? Um, But, you know, motivational fit in a sales job is you can't have a guy answering the question, well, I like the security of a salary. That becomes a problem in a sales job. And so, It's, it's th- that basic understanding of it. And so, you know, I was blessed to be a part of a, uh, a great organization in Novastar. And I learned a lot from, from Dave and Lance Anderson and Scott Hartman and all those guys that are really, really smart people. And um, I soaked it up. But I soaked it up because I was into it. And I was into it because I love being a problem solver um, and building something. Well, and so you, that's, you know, when you look forward at, you know, whether it be 101 and some of these other businesses that I'm involved in, it's I realized at that stage is I'm a builder. I, I don't know if I'm a great manager. I don't think people would call me a great manager. 
I think they would call me a good, a good builder and you build and your foundation is based on the people that you surround yourself with that allow you to execute on the plan. Right. I don't know if I'm a great, great guy. Like when we get, we'll get into franchising here in a little bit, but it's one of the reasons why I like franchising is, you know, franchising is I didn't develop it. I didn't, I didn't make it. I didn't create the system. I didn't create the model. What my requirement is to execute on the plan that's already been developed. And then put the and right people in place. And that, and that's getting the right, and that's getting the right people, but understanding the competencies relative to the positions that are required to make that business go. So, um, yeah. And then after Novastar, um, well, I, let me back up a little bit as I became a regional manager, did very well. Um, the, uh, Dave Pazgan moved up to president of that organization. He moved me up to national sales manager. Um, I was only there for a short period of time, not due to my own uh, shortcomings, but because the industry imploded. Yeah. In January of 2007, uh, we did, Novastar did about 1.5 billion in mortgage production. And in February, we did zero. And so everybody knows, and I won't go into detail about that, but, you know, the mortgage crisis of 2007, which essentially said that, um, uh, you know, if you, if you, if you loaned a dollar, that dollar was now based on the rating agencies worth 50 cents. Well, who's going to loan a dollar if it's worth 50, 50 cents when you, when you lend it. So right. we shut essentially the, the faucet was shut off immediately. And we hibernated for about six months thinking it was going to be, you know, 1997, 1998, where it's a short term mortgage crisis, but everybody knows it was bigger than that right? yeah. based on what happened. And so in, in August, August 14th, 2007, I was 13 days away from my 40th birthday, had two young kids, um, and uh, we shut it down. I fired lots of people, including myself. And, uh, you know, I'm out there essentially swimming naked because the industry that I had just been involved with with the last 10 years no longer existed there were no jobs there was nothing zero couldn't find a job so um, so and, and like just to give this some context and i mean you don't have to share specific numbers but i mean i know just from talking to you and knowing you for a long time i mean you were making serious money at, at this point in time i mean you were, you were making good money for you know a guy that's relatively young young family and then basically in no time, it pretty much went to zero in terms of your income and job prospects going forward. Yeah, I mean, well, you think, think about this. You have a, and, I, and, and look, I want to provide some background to this is that there were a lot of unsmart people that made a lot of money in the mortgage business, right? Because if you could actually fog a mirror and you worked, you could make money in the mortgage industry. And there were a lot of bad things going on. Uh, I don't believe Novastar and, you know, a lot of the other companies were a part of that. I think it was more at a higher level than that. But um, <clears throat> I worked as a national sales manager. We had 446 reps across the country. We were doing multiple billion dollars a year in uh, loan origination. Um, and I was the, again, the, the national sales manager managing 23 regional managers who manage 440 reps. And so the money was good. It was, it was, it was really, really good. Um, fortunately for me is, is that I came from a, you know, conservative background and I say conservative in terms of financial conservative. Right. Um, and that I came from, basically, I was broke. In my late 20s, was broke and terrified. So anytime I made any type of money whatsoever is, I didn't spend it all. Yeah. Now, did I spend probably more than I should? Yeah, I bought boats. I bought extra cars. 
I did, you know, probably things I shouldn't do in terms of, you know, we went to Disney World and instead of booking at, you know, the uh, contemporary, I go to like uh, the, the, uh, the Floridian, right. which is yeah. like $200 <laughs> more a night, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so, <clears throat> you know, I, I kind of did that, but I always made sure monthly, annually, quarterly or whatever, I was putting some money away. And I'm glad I did because, you know, when I was at Nova Star is, you know, every year they would give me preferred stock. They would give me options. Uh, and that went on for five or six years as quote unquote, an executive in the company. And so I was looking, you know, at 39 years old, hey, I'm going to work another 10 or 11 years in this industry and I'm going to check out. I'm going to do something different. I'm going to have five, six, seven million dollars in the bank. It's all going to be good. This is never going to end. Um, but I did have this side of my brain that said, you know, you need to don't spend it all. Put Save some a little bit for a rainy day. Out. Yeah. Save a little bit. And, you know, I'm glad that happened because when Novastar ended is I needed two or three years of annual income, not at the same lifestyle we were living to be able to support my family. And so um, I know that, that when Novastar shut down on August 14th is it was, it was a freak out moment within a matter of several weeks. I sold my boat at a loss. Uh, I had a Toyota Sequoia that I sold at a loss. Um, my wife get, kept her van for the kids. Yeah. <laughs> um, I drove to Raleigh and bought a five-speed champagne-colored Jetta cloth interior because I was scared, yeah. right? I wanted yeah. to become as elastic as I could you know, be, which is I needed to shrink as fast as possible. Yep. Just not knowing what the future would hold relative to my skill set in my resume, my resume was essentially the mortgage industry. And that entire industry was gone in the blink of an eye. And there was nothing out there. And so, you know, I know that's gonna segue into the next point, which is, is I didn't have a choice. My choice is, it's, you know, go wait tables or create your own deal. Yep. And so I went on a six month expedition discovery process of trying to figure out what are we going to do next? What are we as a family going to do next? And how am I going to provide for my family in a similar capacity as I'd been able to do in the past? And, and again, you know, I think it's worth noting how, how smart you were to have put some money away, right? Because had you not had that kind of nest egg or whatever you want to call it, I mean, you would have essentially been forced to take the first thing that came along. It could have been waiting tables, going back to selling cars. You could have been weaving hammocks again. I mean, who knows? But at least you you had enough saved that it gave you some runway to, to kind of take your time and really think strategically about, hey, what's next? And, you know, so like you said, you spent six months or so really kind of looking around at, at the world and the economy and trying to identify some opportunities. So, you know, what did you do? What did you do next? Well, I mean, you know, we did, I did spend six months researching the, uh, essentially the economy, which is, you know, the mortgage business is just a industry, but that industry impacted countless other industries. And you saw the domino effect, you know, as we look back now, we didn't know them, but the domino effect of what that created which there was this huge retraction, you know, in, in other business opportunities, et cetera. People weren't putting out money. They weren't hiring. It was kind of this, everything's on freeze. And in fact, there was, you know, kind of a retraction on a lot of businesses where they were saying, we got to get smaller uh -huh. to actually weather the storm. And so uh, I had a, uh, a guy that worked for me at Novastar that happy, happened to live in my hometown and I knew him, his name was Keith Barnhart. And so him and I started to get together and look at what are we gonna do? We looked at, you know, building apartment complexes. We looked at uh, 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 Snap Fitness as a franchise opportunity. We looked at curves, 
uh, as a franchise. Don't smile. We looked at <laughs> curves as a franchise opportunity. We were looking at anything and everything, and maybe there was something that we could partner in. And, um, you know, it was, uh, I think at the end of the day, we came to the conclusion that it looked, it appeared to us at the time. Now, you got to remember, this is late 2007, that the only thing that may be recession proof in this, in this climate, in this environment, was something to do in the medical or DME industry, durable medical equipment company industry, that people are going to spend money or the government is going to fund health, right? So yep. whether it be preventative, maintenance, future, et cetera, there, there was gonna be dollars there that maybe we could get involved somehow, some way in those dollars, again, my dad was a plastic surgeon, great guy. I thought maybe I could use some of my uh, connections through him to get involved in the DME business, durable medical. What does that mean? That's walkers, canes, sleeves, anything you think of in terms of, you know, uh, uh, medical equipment that, you know, people need to actually have some type of mobility issue or dealing with whatever their issue is wheelchairs etc and so that that was that was the general initial thought that okay if we get into that business at least we can survive and make a living for our family yep and so we started to investigate that um we were on a call with curbs laugh laugh uh it was a franchise call so we had already gone through a couple little gates to get to that point Sure. And sure. Keith's father, uh, Royce Bornhart, called him and he's like, hey, man, I got to take this call. I'm going to step out for a second. I was like, no big deal. Well, Keith's dad was doing um, some side work. He had just retired from PPG, Pittsburgh Paint and Glass, and he was doing side work uh, for a guy named Roger Bowman at Penrod Medical in Salisbury, North Carolina. And um, he was installing for Roger auto lifts. Well, these are lifts that fit on the back of your car or in your car that carry a wheelchair around. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Keith's dad was telling, you know, Keith that, hey, you know, Roger's got this DME company in Salisbury. It seems to be doing pretty well, et cetera. And Keith came back in and after the curse call, he's like, hey man, we need to go see Roger Bowman in Salisbury. And I said, well, set it up. So we exited the call, uh, figured out a um, time to meet Roger. We went up to Roger. His pitch was on the DME business and was happy to share with us how he developed his durable medical equipment business. Um, but I noticed on the back wall that he had a whiteboard and that whiteboard um, was the VA deals and all of them were auto lifts. It's the VA hospital in Salisbury. Um, and they were auto lift scheduled. And I was like, interesting, tell me about that. And, and you know, he went on and on about that. But we didn't have a VA hospital in Wilmington. Yep. The closest hospital to us was in Durham or in Raleigh, North Carolina. So that was kind of a secondary thought, but it was all off on the sideline. Um, so Keith and I, after so, several meetings with Roger, giving us some intel, et cetera, created a DME company. That DME company was called Durable, uh, was called Lifestyle Mobility and Medical Supply Company. It's a pretty long name. <laughs> for, <laughs> hey, I heard for, a story at, at one point, uh, someone thought your van was full of condoms because it was called, it had lifestyle on the side of it. Is that true? That's exactly right. That's exactly <laughs> what we got. That's, yeah, that's exactly right. We got contacted. <laughs> Uh, at some point, and people asking, if, or that person asking if we sold condoms. <laughs> and I'm hilarious. like, we don't, but I can get you some. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> hey, I'm looking for something to sell, like if there's a market for it. Yeah, so so Keith and I go through this process of going to the uh, uh, North Carolina Board of Pharmacy, getting our DME license, et cetera. Um, and so we set this whole thing up, and that was on March 8th. 2008. So it's about eight, nine months after I lose my job and Keith lost his job. 
And so um, uh, we find out that as of March 1st, we got our license on March 8th, but as of March 1st, in order to be able to bill Medicare, Medicaid, or any insurance, Blue Cross, whatever, uh, United Health, um, Cigna, whatever, you had to be accredited by a third party agency. That's ACHC, JCO, whatever. And there are several different accrediting bodies. So what does that mean? That means that this third party comes in and says, looks at your processes and all this other kind of gives you a stamp of approval and says you're good to go. Well, so we were like, okay, no big deal. This is gonna be the, essentially the foundation of our business is to be able to bill these entities. So we call ACHC. We can't see you until September of 2009. Whoa. Not 2008, 2009. Jayco, same thing. All these other rating, same thing. Why? Because we were on the back of the line because we didn't exist before. And so all these other companies that were having to become accredited uh, actually took precedence over a new company. Because it just became a requirement right before you set the business up. Yeah. And honestly, it was a blessing in disguise, mm -hmm. which is that was that day on March 8th was the directional change of lifestyle mobility and medical supply from being a DME company to being a company that focused on access and mobility that were that had nothing to do with reimbursement from Medicare and Medicaid. And it was almost like, you know, you could say divine in for intervention it was it was a uh it, it we didn't know it at the time we were pissed right we're yeah pissed. You're like, this is the worst we're thing that could broke. have happened we're going broke it was the best thing that ever happened so explain explain what you mean by access and mobility equipment how is that different from from dme so access and you know call it mobility equipment is it's primarily access so when we talk about DME equipment, we're talking about wheelchairs, we're talking about scooters, we're talking about um, bariatric commodes, uh, we're talking about uh, walkers, um, uh, the traditional things you would see in a, um, like uh, a, a CBS or whatever, where they're selling these supplies. Yeah, kind of lower, lower ticket items. Lower ticket items, and they are, um, the, the reimbursement for those when you bill your insurance or Medicare or Medicaid, whatever, is that usually the customer is not having to come out of pocket to pay for that. Right. So a doctor is writing a prescription for those things and then they're, they're sending it to an insurance, an insurance company approves it and then they get reimbursed. Um, and so that's how that worked and that's how we thought we were going to it's a, more of a volume play than anything else. Sure. When you think about accessibility, you're thinking about ramps, stair lifts, uh, vertical platform lifts, elevators, patient lifts, and primarily patients lift. We're talking about ceiling lifts, mm -hmm. not necessarily some of the other you know, manual type of lifts. So bigger, bigger equipment that helps people with some sort of a physical disability get in and out of their home more safely or around their home more Correct. safely. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So we were based on our understanding with Roger Bowman, back to my Salisbury story, mm -hmm. is we knew he had a relationship with the VA and they were buying auto lifts. Well, auto lifts are not covered by Medicare, Medicaid, insurance. It, that's, a, that's a personal expense. If you want to buy auto lift, you buy it. And so what we knew is the VA was providing that service to their veterans based on their service connection. And so uh, when we went to Roger, we were like, well, what else does the VA buy? And he was like, well, they buy ramps, they buy stair lifts, they buy elevators, they buy this, they buy that, they buy all this other kind of stuff. Non-Medicare, Medicaid, insurance doesn't handle that, but the VA was handling so uh, uh, our initial strategy based on the corner that we were backed into, which was not being able to provide DME equipment, is Keith and I went to uh, Fayetteville, which has a VA, and we went to Durham Hospital, which did not have a VA. And if you have veterans in our area, we'll be happy to service them. And so that's the genesis of how this got started, which is, 
you know, our first order was a pair of diabetic socks, like eight <laughs> bucks. <laughs> Cost us five dollars and we made three bucks. <laughs> yeah. But our next order was delivering a bariatric bed. It weighed like 680 pounds, the bed. And we had to deliver that and we would pay, get paid a delivery fee for delivering it in our local community. Um, By the VA. So that was the VA. Yeah. So, oh, you know, over the course of, you know, six or eight months, we started to understand how the VA worked and all of the other things that they purchased, which, like I mentioned, were stair lifts and verticals and elevators and patient lifts, et cetera. And so I started to hire people to work at 101 Mobility that were in other areas and other locations. You had Jim Kowalski in Cleveland. You had the other guy in Pittsburgh. You had Lori Welton in Florida. You had uh, Janice in Green, uh, uh, Greenville, uh, South Carolina. And so we started to teach them how to work in the VA. And um, within the first eight months, we did a million dollars in sales. And we had no idea what we we're doing. Zero. Zero, not one idea of what we're doing. So I knew at that moment, at that moment, we were on to something. Yeah. I knew we were missing something, but I knew we were on to something. Yeah, you do a million we dollars in eight months, you're definitely on to something. Yeah. And so what 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 I knew we were, what we were missing was the analytical piece. Yeah. I'm a very I, I would consider myself a very good uh hire of talent. Um, I'm a good trainer. Keith was really good at the product part. Mm -hmm. yeah. He missed the analytical piece on how to grow the business. And so fortunately for me is my relationship with Dave Pascan, who was my boss before, who's a very analytical guy, is we reached out to him in December of 2008 and asked if he were interested in being a part of it. And what made me feel really good about where we were is that Dave flew down, looked at the business, looked at where we were, and accepted the challenge, which I think if he would have said, eh, I don't know, you know. You'd be like, well, maybe, cool. maybe we're not on to something. Yeah, I mean, you've done, yeah, you've done good, but you're not like, you know. But when he said I'm in, I was like, look out. That, and, and, and I'm not saying we figured it out. We didn't figure it out. We figured out that the industry was fragmented. Mm -hmm. We figured out that there were no, there was no major players in it, that there was no rhyme or reason to why somebody used this guy or that guy. And so I think we figured that out. And then we figured out that you had a baby boomer population, 1946 to 1964. That was, you know, on the, oh, just literally on the cusp of starting to create, some real noise in the industry. Well, we got 30 years left to go for the, before that starts to decline. Even mm -hmm. today, 30 years left to go. So we have a huge you know, window with the 101 Mobility brand um, to, uh, to capitalize on that. And so uh, when he came on board, I got very excited about that because I knew that our kind of initial digging into an industry was um we were on the right path so you kind of i mean you kind of fell backwards into this this industry of access and mobility equipment figured out that the va hospital system across the country is buying and providing this equipment for veterans that have a need for it and to give it some context we're talking much higher ticket items in ramps, stair lifts, auto lifts, platform lifts than, you know, what we were talking about earlier with DME. I mean, you're, you're talking thousands of dollars, you know, for you're talking about the average ticket equipment. in DME is 250 bucks. The average ticket in access and mobility is 3,500. Right. So a little bit less of a volume play than DME would have had to be, but yeah. you guys quickly pivoted, figured out, how to kind of navigate this this VA hospital system, figure out how it worked, realized, wow, this is a very fragmented industry. There's not, you know, one company. Uh, they're just kind of finding anyone in a particular area that they could, that could not only provide the equipment, but also install it. So then you guys figured out where to get the product from, figured out what manufacturers to get it from, set up relationships with them. 
set up these kind of little satellite offices in various parts of the country that Correct. were strategically near VA hospitals. Correct. And, you know, next thing you know, over eight months, you've done a million dollars. So, I, I mean, I just, I love the story because number one, it shows, you know, you're in, and Keith's resilience when, you know, you kind of get slapped in the face with the indus- the mortgage industry just disappearing literally almost overnight. And you weren't afraid to roll your sleeves up and, and do some dirty work, right? I mean, I remember yeah, you I telling mean, me I- a story where you guys, you and Keith were literally in a van with a ramp driving somewhere late at night trying to figure out how to install this ramp. No clue what you're doing. Um, but, I mean, you guys yeah. put in the work to figure it out. Yeah, I mean, I would say that, um, yeah, absolutely, 100%. Uh, I would say that, you know, um, I use a lot of analogies. And, you know, a lot of times your parents, when you're watching a sporting event for your son, it's more nervous for them than it is for your son, right? right? Because you're in it. This was more nervous for my wife than it was for me. Yeah. Because she wasn't in the action, and all she saw was a shrinking bank account. (laughs) Right. So she didn't, she didn't get to see the development of the business. She was trusting me when I came home was like, hey, this is hard, but we're moving forward. Well, how are we moving forward when we're going backwards 10,000 a month? Right. And so, you know, the, the, I, I would say the more stressful part to me because I was in it and in the mix and fighting every day to grow my business is that it was more, it was more uh, uh, trying to reassure my family Mm. that which was more stressful than it was for me at work because once I showed up every day it was kind of like well this is where we are right we're here let's go yeah right and it was fast paced I mean you guys were moving fast moving fast and so um you know but but what I realized uh, you know at at being at Novastar is I like building right so building was good for me I went from 5 million to 65 or 70 million a year. And I knew how to build. Well, how do you build? You get the right people. Hey, you got to make sure you're in the right industry, right? We're probably not building at that time if we're in the construction or mortgage business. Right. And so we knew we were in the right industry to go six months in or eight months in and do a million bucks. Now it's like, well, how do we, you know, if that's the case. Holy crap. We're doing this in the Great Recession. Okay, if we're doing it in the Great Recession, what happens if it becomes an economic boom? That's right. Okay, so we're 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 in the right space. Um, we just got to figure out how to capitalize on it. But when you're spending money every month on the business personally, and you're not taking any money in, your family gets concerned. Yeah. And so my biggest issue was not the business and what I had to do in terms of my roles and you know, doing everything and every, you know, anything and everything. It was more convincing my family to chill out because dad's driving a Volkswagen Jetta. (laughs) Right. Like, Hey, we'll get another Sequoia. (laughs) We'll get another Sequoia. Calm down. Yeah. I mean, it's like, and it'll have leather. Relax. It'll be fine. So, I mean, I remember days when, when, you know, I get excited about having enough money to go to the grocery store. Yeah. And so, I mean, we've all been there, right? Yeah. We get a check and we're like, hey, I get to go to the grocery store and spend $100. Yeah. So, I get it. Um, so, you guys well, realize I, that, I, that there's this big opportunity and, and then you brought Dave in to kind of, you know, be that analytical, you know, guy. Yes, how, how do we take it? How do we, how do we actually take advantage of it, right? That was the big thing is how do we take advantage of it? I didn't necessarily know. If you ask me to go sell something, I can do it. If you ask me to go hire somebody, I can do it. If you're asking me, how do I, you know, look at four and five corners or stages uh, ahead of where we are, I approached everything. And this, I know this is my skill set. I approached everything. What is in front of me and how do I, how do I deal with that? Right. With Dave, it's like looking three or four or five steps ahead. Mm Mm-hmm and developing a plan and how do we go from you know not a to b but a to h right and so it was it was critical to you know for our success long term and 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 where we went 
to to bring him on. And it wasn't it wasn't comfortable bringing on a third partner in a business that, in eight months in a horrible uh, economic environment where we're actually doing okay, to bring on a third partner. But you know, I always ask people this question: Do you want to be worth fifty percent of one million, or do you want to be worth thirty percent of thirty million? Yeah. I mean, you can you can answer that question. It's pretty easy. Yep. Right. No doubt. No doubt. And there's no there's no you know there's no guarantees, but at the same time is is that was that was the mathematical equation that we had to do in our head, bringing him on, and it was worth every penny that we gave up to bring him in so what was the plan after dave came on board how did you guys capitalize and and continue growing the business well number one is is dave had to get acclimated to the business that took about three months and then it was understanding that we needed to change our name and so dave was the uh catalyst to you know, the 101 mobility. And in fact, it came from his wife and need because, you know, at that time we were primarily VA uh, dominated in terms of, we didn't do a ton in retail. Right. Um, and when we looked at the kind of the, uh, called the alphabetized order of uh, the way the VA listed out um, uh, their vendors, is one eight hundred wheelchairs was first, <laughs> but one zero beat one eight. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I love it. That that's that, that's essentially the you know the, the kind of the genesis of the name is is how do we beat one out one eight hundred wheelchairs, which was number one on the vendor list in the VA. Right. So you you better come up with a better a better name that actually puts you at the top of the list when people start to look at who they're going to actually deal with. So and believe 101 it or not, Mobility was born. 101 Mobility was born. Give all the credit to Anid uh, Pazgan for coming up with that idea. And so – It's brilliant if you, you know, think about it because, I mean, especially back then, that's – I mean, I can see these purchasing agents in the VA literally just going to the list and kind of running down like, all right, who do we have? Uh, 101 Mobility, they might not even get to 1-800 wheelchairs. No, exactly right. So now, did that help us? Yes, I think it did help us. Did it create confusion in the retail market? Yeah. Do you know how many people have come by and said, hey, man, I want y'all do cell phones? Yeah, I need a burner phone. <laughs> I need a burner phone. No. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but ultimately, that's how brands are built and, and made. And that, you know, who knew what Google would be or whatever. And I'm not equating one to the other. But what's a Google? You know, and so yeah. um, I think that, you know, over the course of years, we've done our, uh, a good job in developing a good brand. Um, but, you know, it was it was it was tough. I can't I can't I can't tell you it wasn't tough. I can't tell you it wasn't stressful. Anybody who's out there looking at doing their own thing, starting their own business, doing a startup is it's, it's a it's a tough it's a tough gig. It's a tough tough gig i well, went three and, years with no income yeah and it's it's a good point and and i think you know there's kind of a theme that you know this conversation is is starting to have which is you know you you don't need to always have a plan right i mean so to fast forward a little bit you know you guys changed the name to 101 mobility and you decide that the best way to continue growing the business and the brand is to franchise it right Correct. But you guys had zero intention of franchising this business when you first started. Zero. Zero. Um, you know, so I think it's a, it's a, just a great example of that. You know, you can start something with one thing in mind and if it plays out that way, great, but you gotta be nimble and you gotta be willing to pivot when you need to. And, and you never know where it might go. Right. Yeah. I mean, I mean, our, 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 our uh, transition from corporate owned stores to, uh, franchising was simple, which is um, that uh, we had, I don't know, maybe 12 or 15 reps um, throughout the country, all the way over to Kansas, um, that basically worked in the VA. 
hospital, and that's where a majority of our business came from. And then we started to develop the idea behind retail or B2B referral. Um, if it could be workers' comp, it could be nonprofits. Um, it, it, there, there's a host of other not or, you know, or just, or just some someone that needs the product, but they're not a veteran, so the VA is not going to. They're not a veteran where the veteran's paying for it, where the VA is paying on their behalf, right? right. Yeah. And so those those accounts needed to be developed, and we realized there's this huge industry out there besides the VA, um, and that our sales reps were unwilling to do what was hard. They were making what I would consider a decent living off of just focusing on the VA, which is great, but we needed to do more. Yeah. And they were unwilling to do it. What we understood is if you have somebody with skin in the game, which is potentially a franchise E mm -hmm. that they would do the hard stuff, which is do the development of the B2B, the nonprofits, the this, plus they would do the VA, right? And so um, uh, that, that, that didn't take long for us to figure out. And I give Keith Barnhart the credit for coming in and saying that maybe we ought to consider franchising. Um, and, and so we actually contacted a company in Chicago called Off Franchise who was very excited about our opportunity because it was unique that yeah. nobody had done it before. Yeah. And so they were excited about that because also it had a story to tell and is a feel good story. And I can tell you right now, it is a feel good story because every day that I worked at one one helping people transform their independent life or from non-dependent and independent to dependent independent was like, you didn't have a, there was no better feeling than helping somebody who was disabled to be able to operate on their own. Yeah. So people got it. The story was uh, uh, easy to tell. And then, so that was what year that you guys started franchising? 2010, two years after we started the business. So you started franchising in 2010, you hired me in 2011. And then next thing you know, you got bought by private equity. End of story. <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not, kidding. Not but in the story is, you know, I, I know one of your questions is how do you seek out? How did you seek out? Uh, you know, Cortec and the private equity is we didn't seek them out. They sought us. Um, they sought us through a uh, relationship through a manufacturer that we dealt with, which was Harmar. Mm -hmm. um, Harmar, we bought some product from. They were a manufacturer of ours. Uh, Cortec had purchased. Um, Harmar the year before I think it was a smart move on their part and so they, I think that what they felt like is is that if they could kind of <clears throat> control both sides mm -hmm. which is a feeder system which is the 101 mobility network a franchise ease uh, and creates you know some type of synergies there where they may get more of uh, the product purchases from or from the franchisees to harm or it'd be a good relationship. And that makes perfect sense. Yeah. I think they were absolutely correct on that. The reason we were interested in a buyout is because when you get into franchising in terms of being a franchisor is that um, the support system relative to a hundred franchisee system or a one franchisee system is essentially the same. Right. You have to provide marketing support, field support, training support. You call it system support or CRM support. You have to develop all these things that work, right? So whether you have one or you have a hundred, that whole support system has to kind of be in place. Right. And if you don't have good validations from your current franchise networks in terms of the you know, support that the franchisor provides, sure. you're not going to grow your business. Right. right? Good luck. Good so, luck selling franchises with good luck, bad good validation. Luck. Yeah, absolutely. So we had to create this thing and it put us in a position where the revenue that we received from royalty and marketing fund contributions had not hit the tipping point where it outweighed what we were spending in sport. So we were going in debt month after month after month after month. And I think, you know, all three of us, Dave, myself, and Keith, got concerned whether or not we could sustain 
uh, that, and this was an opportunity for us to partner with somebody, they could come in and say, we'll handle it till you get to that point. Looking back, would I have done it, knowing hindsight, you know, hindsight's 2020, it's an old cliche. No, I would, I, would, I would have gone and tried to borrow $2 million, right? Um, but it is what it is. I don't look back and regret. It put me on a new pathway to owning my own businesses in terms of franchising and, um, you know, other opportunities. And so um, am I not as rich as I could have been? <laughs> am I as happy? I'm, I'm just as happy, if not more happy. So well, and, and I think and for me, that's learned, what it's all about. Well, and you learned so much along the way, right? I mean, you learned, I mean, you, you learned how to build a franchise system, right? Absolutely. Built it to the point where it was attractive enough for private equity to come in, which, which happens all the time in franchising. It's not uncommon yeah. at all for yeah. private equity to come in and essentially buy a emerging franchise concept, inject it with capital, grow it like crazy. And then their goal is usually to sell it six or seven years down the road obviously for a profit. Um, but I mean, you guys did it in a short period of time. I mean, it's 2010 that you start franchising it and then 13, right? Or 14. Five, five, uh, Keith and I, from the, from, from the date we opened, which was March 8th to May 13th, 2013. So yep. that's incredible. That is incredible. That's it's, incredible. Five it years. Is. And, and, and I think everything that you, you learned along the way, um, you know, I'm speaking for you, but I, I unless you disagree, I mean, it, everything that you learned through that experience has been invaluable and helped you out in everything that you've done since then. No question. I would say that, that I, I wouldn't say that I necessarily learned anything in that process with the exception of I learned the technical aspects of franchising. Well, that's that's what I'm what I was getting at. Because after private equity comes in, you kind of exit stage left pretty shortly thereafter from the the corporate side yeah. of one hundred and one mobility. And then what did you do? Well, um, so I, I was there for an additional year to make sure they had their transfer of information and training and the things that I was responsible for in the organization. And then I left to pursue other opportunities. Uh, that was in August of 2014. But I kind of, but, but the die had been cast for me in terms of uh, what I wanted to do, which was <clears throat> essentially to, instead of playing all the instruments in a band, I wanted to start to figure out how do I conduct all the instruments in the band. I'm a much better conductor than I'm a player of instruments. Can I play? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can play. And I think that any, anytime you get involved in a business, you under, under, understand your business intimately and understand each position and how it works. But you're going to be inefficient, ineffective, ineffective, whatever you want to call it, if you're trying to wear all the hats and do everything. Yep. So what I realized in that period of time is, is that I wanted to invest in concepts, that were proven to work and in people relative to my background in terms of hiring and partnering with people to run the operations. I'll make the investment. I'll do the coaching. I'll do a lot of the background stuff that happens in it, but I'm going to invest in young people who have the will and I'll train or help train the skill to make it happen. And as I recoup my investment, those young people earn and own more ownership in their business. A lot of times people have the ability, they just don't have the dollars to make mm -hmm. it happen. Sure. And so what I wanted to do is provide the dollars and partner with people to actually say, I wanna help you become free, right? Free of corporate America, free of whatever, but, but it's what you want. It's what the person I'm partnering with wants out of their life that dictates whether or not that I'm willing to partner with them. And yeah. so it, it doesn't mean that I don't do the hard work still. I do the hard work, but some of the hard work is I enjoy it. Right. Yeah. But I don't want to be involved in necessarily the day-to-day -day operations anymore. And so if, if I have a partner that doesn't have the capital 
that is willing to take on the day-to-day -day operations. As I recoup my investment, they earn more distribution rights. And at the end, we become, you know, a, I wouldn't call it equal partnership because it's cash is king, right? Um, but they may end up owning more distribution rights than I own. And I'm okay with that as long as I got or, or recouped my investment. Well, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. Cause I mean, basically what you're doing is you're, you're investing in, as you said earlier, concepts that are proven to work. So you've done yep. this primarily with, with franchise businesses, investing as a franchisee and, and then partnering with, you know, younger hungry people that may not have their own capital to go out and do something like start a franchise. And then, you know, essentially they're handling the day to day. You're providing strategic, guidance and support and you know coaching as needed your goal is to get your money back that you invested as quickly as possible and then have steady cash flow each month That's it. um and you've done Plain it you, you did it with a one-on-one -on -one mobility franchisee i mean that's one of my favorite things about this story is you left the corporate side of the business and then turned around pretty shortly thereafter and bought out an existing one-on-one -on -one mobility franchisee and you've grown that business astronomically since since you did that yeah uh, the the guy who owned it before us uh he was there three years and did seven hundred thousand in sales and in the time that we bought it which was in 2015 july um and this uh last year we did 3.2 million in sales and so is that a good investment it's a great investment right and so um the the I, w I would, I, w I guess I would warn everybody out there who's listening to this is like, the concept is one thing, right? And you need to do your due diligence on the concept for sure. Making sure, you know, the industry has uh, the ability to expand, that you have the ability to grow it, et cetera. Uh, but the critical piece is people, right? Plain and simple is you can have the best concept on the planet. You can look at franchise opportunities to the day as long. But if you are an absentee owner or a semi-absentee owner and you don't get the right people, it's not going to work. Yeah, good luck. So your focus as a person who is looking at franchise opportunities is do your due diligence on the concept. For sure. That's number one. Um, but number two is, is if you're going to be involved in it on the day-to-day, -day, make sure the operational requirements that are are – your obligation to make to happen to be successful in the execution process is if you can't do it you better get somebody who can and if you get the wrong people you're going to have a miserable experience yeah and if you get the right people it's uh it's, it's it can be fun it's actually can be really fun well and that's good advice you know because a lot of people out there might be looking at you know, investing in a franchise where they're going to run it themselves versus kind of what you're doing which is a little bit more passive, right? But yeah. at least in terms of being involved in the the day to day. But that's that's one of the biggest things I try to coach people on when I'm working with them to find a franchise. And it's it's counterintuitive to so many people is they want to look at all right, what's a business that you know I'm I'm pa passionate about? What's something I can get into business that's gonna you know really play to my passions or something like that? And it's like no, the first thing you've got to figure out is what type of business is gonna play to your skill set the best in terms of your role as the owner. And, and so if it's something that's going to require a lot of your time as the owner in a certain area that either you're not very good at, or you just simply don't enjoy doing, stay away from that business. I don't care if it's something that, you know, you are passionate about, you'll end up being miserable and you probably won't be that successful either because Absolutely. it's requiring you to do things that, that you're not good at or you don't like doing and I would include with that, if it's a business that's going to require employees, you better make sure you feel comfortable hiring, training, and managing employees. <laughs> Otherwise, no doubt. You know, it's probably going to fail. And, and a lot of people like, I mean, restaurants are a good example, right? A lot of people are like, hey, I want to I get into this restaurant franchise because they've got great food and we don't really have anything like that here. Okay, well, do you have any restaurant experience? Well, no. Well, have you ever hired and, and managed hourly employees? Well, no, not really. So why do you want to own a restaurant? 
you know, I know that's crazy. It happens all the time. So I, I mean, that's good advice. And, and, you know, I mean, I, I like what you're doing. I've learned a lot from you and, and for the record, I mean, you're partners with us in, in one of our businesses and, you know, exact same scenario, you know, Kelly and I were very young. We didn't have the capital to do it on our own. We could have gone out and gotten a loan, but you know, you and I've known each other for years at this point. You've been a mentor to me, um, become good friends. And, and I knew that this was kind of something that you were, you had done, you were looking to do more of it and it just kind of made sense. And it's been great. It's been good for you. It's been good for us. You know, we'll likely do more deals like this. Going Absolutely. Forward. Uh, and for me, it's like, Hey, I'm, I'm getting to kind of watch how you're doing it. And I'm not going to say how much younger I am than you, but uh, enough. It's a lot. Uh, <laughs> But, but I'm, I'm kind of like, you know, I like, I like this model of doing it, right? And, you know, this is something that we can, as we, you know, become more and more financially successful, you know, we'll have capital to go and invest in people that don't have the capital to do it themselves and are willing to put in the, the sweat equity. And then, you know, we can kind of take on the role that, that you have in the businesses that you're invested in. So, you know, it's, it's yeah. been a lot of fun for me to watch kind of how you're doing this and, and then, you know, set ourselves up so that we can kind of do the same. And, and, you know, uh, just, I guess to be uh, clear is it's not just self-serving on my part. That is, that that's one piece of it, but it's also to empower younger people who don't have the capital to be able to coach and train them in how to make it happen. Right. Mm -hmm. I get, I, I personally get a lot of satisfaction out of your success. I get a lot of sex, satisfaction out of Lisa's success. I get a lot of satisfaction after John Roller's success. And so it's, it's uh, even though, you know, most of those partners that I just mentioned are making a majority of the income, it's, I recoup my investment, right? My investments recoup that that's, you know, kind of, you could say it number one. Yeah, sure. But after that, it's, it's the, it's the kind of passing the baton on to show this is, I think this is how you do it, which is you get involved with people who want to make it happen. They have the will. You can say they have the skill, but they don't necessarily have the ability uh, financially to make it happen. But if they have that financial backing that they will knock down brick walls. Yep. Well, I want to open that. I want to open that wall up for them so they can, so they can provide for their family. But not only that is, is there's a next generation behind you yeah. and a next generation behind that. And so it's like, it's like this, my goal is not to be rich. It's not, honestly, it's not. It's to actually have life satisfaction. What Steve Jobs said, what I said earlier, it's that I want to enjoy every day what I do. Do I want to provide for my family? Absolutely, I do. But it's literally every day when I wake up, I want to enjoy getting on the phone with you, Kelly, with John, Lisa, with whoever it may be, and working with them to improve their life. And so, well, and, you know, and look, if you do it, if you do it right, it's, it's improving your life too, right? Because absolutely, especially once a business is up and running and, and humming along pretty good, it's not taking up huge amounts of your time. So, you know, you've created this, this very nice lifestyle for yourself where, like you said, you get to get up every day and work on what you want to work on, right? The way I think yep. about it is, and, and this is the way I've tried to, you know, set myself up and want to continue to do is my job every day is not to get up and answer to someone else. My job every day is to wake up and manage my shit, whatever shit I have going on. And, true. and, and I true. mean, that's, you know, that's what you've been able to do. And, and that's what, you know, we're literally in the process of doing ourselves. And, and to me, that's a big part of what, what freedom's all about. What, you know, my company, what the podcast is all about is, it's the ability to work on what you want to work on when you want to work on. It doesn't mean that you don't have to do things that, you know, you'd prefer not to do. Like you're always right. going to have obligations and responsibilities, but you know, at the end of the day, you're picking and choosing what those responsibilities are because you've set yourself up to be in a position to do that. Pause one second. I got to take a piss. All right. Sorry. That's all good. You good? Go ahead. We're recording. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, 
I think I know I'd mentioned earlier that when I was in college, I had I played basketball for Emory and Henry College under a coach, Bob Johnson. And, you know, he was a uh, an interesting guy. His father was a, a four star general, I believe, under Lyndon Johnson. Wow. And he was the uh, Joint Chief of Staff. And so he had a big role. I'm sure he was under a lot of pressure as a son for having that, but having that guy as his dad. Um, he ended up uh, going in the military, following his father, was in Vietnam. Um, I'm sure had a lot of difficult situations that he came up with or came against during that period. Came out and, you know, he wanted to coach basketball. It's very successful. Um, but I, I watched a, a series or a little uh, episode that he did with a guy named Charlie Gibson. Charlie Gibson used to, I think, be a anchor for ABC Good Morning America. But they did a little series called Ball Field to Battlefields. Mm. And um, it was in the era of Desert Storm. And um, I think there was, uh, there was another uh, – uh, Iraq conflict where reservists who played uh, athletics in college who were in the reserves were called up. Hmm. And so they featured him as one of several different coaches in uh, uh, this series called Ballfield to Battlefields. And when he was talking to Charlie Gibson, is in a no way am I equating being in combat to being. A business owner at all but there are some similarities and what he said to Charlie Gibson is is when you're being shot at you've never felt so alive hmm. when you are starting your own business you've never felt so alive yeah because you're aware of everything right you have feelings you've never felt before when you're being shot at you feel every breath according to coach Johnson um, you think about lots of things, but you also have a goal in mind, which is success. Um, he also told Charlie Gibson, when you're being shot at, we all wonder if we'll duck tail and run and we'll stand and fight. Yeah. And he said, you know, the difference between me and you, I know the answer. Whoa. And so Whoa. what I would tell everybody out there who is, looking at becoming a business owner, the difference between me and you, I know the answer. It ain't, it ain't, it, it, it ain't easy. Nope. It's hard. You'll never feel so alive as to, uh, you know, opening up your own joint, putting your own money into it. Um, but will you run or will you make it happen? You, you, if you're close, if you're close right now to making that decision, you kind of already know the answer, but don't you want to know the answer? And For so, sure. well, and, and that, man, I, I love that. And the way that, that he put it, cause I haven't like thought about it in those terms, but I mean, that's the single biggest thing that keeps anyone from actually taking that plunge and and going into business for themselves is it's the fear and it's really the uncertainty of not knowing yeah. how it's going to play out and I see it all the time where people can't get past it and you know I, I think about it and I'm like man they're gonna they're gonna go the rest of their life wondering what if I what if what if I would have done that and to me that's you know having that that kind of regret and, and always having that thought in the back of your head and I mean, I know you're not saying just like, I'm not saying everyone should go start a business. And if you don't start a business, you're, you know, you're a coward or something like that. There's plenty of people out there that have zero desire whatsoever to start a business. And that's fine. You know, who, who you're talking to and who I'm talking to are the people that they can't get that thought out of their head. They're, they're not happy with whatever else it is that they're doing. They know that it's something they should do, but they, they just can't get the courage to jump and and you know i have this conversation with people all the time it's totally normal to have those those feelings of fear uncertainty and doubt you're not human if you're not having those right i mean you've fear, started fear is fear is normal 100 normal and, and coach johnson would tell you today is he didn't walk into any 
combat situation, I have not walked into any business relationship without a level of uncertainty and fear. It's normal, right? Yep. What's abnormal is an abnormal level of fear, right? Which is, and this is why I love franchising. Because franchising removes a lot of the fear because of the disclosure, right? Yeah. Buying a business, even if it's existing or doing a startup, has a lot more level of fear. And it should, right? Because you don't know what you don't know. And in franchising, there's a federal requirement of disclosure. Mm hmm that you are disclosed most anything and everything relative to that industry and that business, including most of the time, not all the time, the item 19 and their financials. Yep. You get to see it, right? Your job, your job in a franchise business is to execute on the plan that's already been developed. Yep. Your job is if you execute is you should expect to some degree what the item 19, which is the financial statement that is laid out to you to be the outcome. If you perform over that, you're going to do a little better. If you perform under that, you're going to do a little worse. And so this is why I personally love franchising because the model's already been proven out. It's just your ability at that point to be able to execute. Yep. And if you can execute, then it's almost like a no brainer given you have chosen the right concept that it matches up to the, your wants, needs, and desires of a business with the operational requirements of the business. Yep. That's it. And that's Wes's job is to kind of help you figure that out, right? And to be able to match you up with that. There's no, you know, Wes wouldn't do a good job if he's putting you in a business that doesn't meet the requirements of what you've told him versus what the operational requirements are. Yep. And so to me, it's like, th this, is, this is one of the reasons why I love franchising. It doesn't mean it's easy. It doesn't mean the climb out is easy. It doesn't mean at all. It means if you execute on the plan, you should perform at the expectation levels that were disclosed to you. If you buy a business independently of franchising, there's no requirement by law to disclose anything and everything. That's right. And so now I'm not saying don't go buy an existing business or don't go do a startup. It's just different. Yep. And there it's, are different expectations relative to that investment. Well, and the other uh, the other thing about franchising is it gives you the ability to run quicker, to grow quicker. I mean, think about our Absolutely. Shelf Genie business and, and how quickly we did get that ramped up. But think about if we would have tried to start a similar business from scratch, we'd had to figure out how to get everything yeah. manufactured, supply chain, you know, branding, all of this. It's it's. I'm not saying it's totally turnkey because it's not. There's a lot of work that goes into any franchise to to get the business, you know, performing well. But it's it's a hell of a lot quicker than if you're trying to figure out everything that the franchisor and the other franchisees before you have already done. So I mean, Absolutely. the way I look at it is, you know, a good franchise dramatically reduces the risk as well as the unknowns that would be there buying an existing non-franchise business or doing a startup. It's not risk-free. It's not risk-free. And the other thing that you've really got to, you know, do to make a good decision is you got to look at yourself in the mirror. And it goes back to what we talked about earlier with understanding what, you know, your role as the franchise owner is and making sure that's something that you're comfortable with, can do well at, and will actually enjoy doing. Because if you don't put in the work, nothing's going to happen. It's not going to just fall into your lap. You do have to put in work, but if you feel confident in your understanding of what your role as the franchise owner is, your ability to execute on that and the, the model itself and what the other franchisees are doing, then it's, it's a hell of a lot less risky than starting your own thing from scratch. Absolutely agree. Um, well, good stuff, man. So, you know, what's, what's next for you? You know, I, I, you know, my, my objective is just so, you know, I guess, you know, and everybody else knows is, is that I have this strategic plan of my life, which is, is I want to continue to invest in concepts that I'm interested in. The concepts mean nothing without the people, right? So we can sit here and talk about, whoa, I like this concept. If you don't, 
if I don't have the operational people to be able to be invested with, then I'm not interested. And yeah. so um, my goal is I'm 52 years old. I have five different businesses currently going right now. Uh, my goal by the time I'm 60 is to have uh, another five. I want to be very, you know, thoughtful uh, about what I invest in and who I invest in. Um, ultimately, I don't need to make all the money. Um, I'm just looking for a piece of it. Um, and uh, so uh, I try to add one a year, uh, one new concept a year, and I plan on doing that for the next four or five years. Um, and I can't tell you what those will be. It may be emerging you know, businesses. It may be existing long-term franchise concepts, et cetera. I'm kind of liking the cleaning industry right now. And the reason I'm liking the cleaning industry is because of unfortunately COVID-19, but yeah. people are aware of it. You can't get clean enough right now. Can't get clean enough. I think that, um, that, that, that is not going away anytime soon. And so I'm kind of excited about, you know, those opportunities that are involved in making things, making sure whether it be businesses or residents that are, um, that are clean and disinfected. Um, I'm interested in those as long as the franchisor has kind of figured out how that works. Um, so that's what's that, that's kind of what's next for me. Um, I, I don't know if I'm interested in doing another startup, uh, you know, independently of a concept that's already worked that kind of didn't fit into my investment strategy. Yeah, um, I'm looking somewhere between a hundred and one hundred and fifty thousand dollars per investment. Um, it doesn't mean that I wouldn't expand that investment if there are other territories and things are working well. Um, but um, that's kind of that's kind of where I am right now. Yeah, I love it, man. And and you know your point about you got to have the right people is is so key. And I mean, you and I talk about a lot of different you know concepts and stuff. And one of the first things we always talk about is who do we know that would be great at running the day-to-day -day of this business. And, yeah. and if we can't like think exactly. of someone in the first 10 minutes, it's like we get less excited about it and <laughs> yeah. you know, we usually move on to something else. But if we're That's like, right. hey, this is a concept, it's interesting, it seems to make sense. And we know someone that we think would crush it, you know, in, in kind of helping yeah. us run the day-to-day, -day, then it gets a hell of a lot more exciting uh, pretty quickly. So, I mean, you yeah. gotta have the right people, no doubt about yeah. it. Um, well, cool, man. This has been awesome. I have no doubt everyone listening in is going to get a ton from it. Uh, love your story. Let's hit the lightning round real quick. Uh, you already gave us the best piece of advice that you've ever received. So uh, next question is, do you have any sort of a morning routine? And if so, do you mind sharing that with us? I do. I uh, get up at 11. No. <laughs> <laughs> Golf course by noon. No. no. I mean, uh, my, my, look, a healthy body is a healthy mind. Yeah. And so um, I would uh, recommend to anybody out there, I don't care what type of exercise it is, but to exercise. So my morning routine is pretty simple is um, I have seven bottles of uh, 500 milliliters of water in the fridge every morning with a, a slice of lemon wedge and a little bit of Himalayan salt. Got that uh, from me. You got that? Yeah, I got that from Wes. I drink, I drink that every morning when I get up. I get up about 6, 6.30, somewhere in that, that area. Have that. I have a cup of, I wish I could drink caffeinated coffee. I don't. I drink decaf coffee. And uh, then I have a, a Quest protein drink, 30 grams of protein, about 140 calories. And I go to the gym at 7.30. I work out from 7.30 to 8.30, do about an hour workout, come back. I take a cold shower. There you go. Um, you know, some days are better than others, honestly, sure. Sure. in the cold shower. And then that, that's, that's how I get my day started five days a week. Saturdays and Sundays, I skip this cold shower and I typically go to a martini. There you so, go. Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Nothing that, wrong with that. That's literally my morning routine. Ah, I love it, man. Um, totally agree with the, the exercise in the morning. I'm not, I'm not, very consistent with exercising in the morning. I've gotten very consistent with exercising daily, many times twice a day now. But uh, the days I do it in the morning, so much more energy, 
more yeah. more clarity throughout the day, better focus. I mean, it's a game no changer. Um, it helps me sleep better too, honestly. Yeah, and the cold showers are are on point. Before we know it, uh, everyone listening to the podcast is going to be doing cold showers. Um, what book are you reading right now? Zero. I don't. I know this is going to be offensive to most people who uh, are listening to this. I don't read books unless it's for pleasure. I don't read. Uh, I think most of the books that are out there today are nothing more than a, uh, uh, a reversion of what's already been written before. Repackaging, yeah. And it's a, uh, uh, I'm not saying that you shouldn't read. I'm not saying that you shouldn't gain intel from other people. It's, I don't find a ton of value in it. Yeah. Um, well, I've gotten some good book recommendations from you over the years, but um, I guess you're taking a hiatus, it sounds like. I have. Yep. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. Final question then. What is your definition of freedom and are you living it? Uh, my def- definition of freedom is essentially controlling my time. Yep. And so when I feel like that I'm in control of my daily activities, that defines freedom for me. And I would say that that doesn't mean less work. It doesn't mean less headaches. It doesn't mean less problems. It means that I'm in control of how that looks in turn. I'm not reporting to somebody. I'm not having to, I don't have to get up to do anything. Yep. I get up because I want to get up. I get up because I want my businesses to do well. I, I get up because I want to be able to coach Lisa. I want to be able to coach uh, Kelly, your wife. And and so for me is is that as long as I'm in the position of where I'm conducting versus playing the instruments, doesn't mean I don't know how to play them. I just don't want to. And now I don't have to. Yep. To me, that's freedom. I love it, man. Well, look, I appreciate you coming on. Yes, sir. Appreciate everything you've done for me. You're a good friend. And um, I appreciate you dropping in on the Path to Freedom podcast with us. I love it. I'm sure we'll talk soon. You're doing a great job. Thank you, man. All right, buddy.